Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be doing an NCLEX review over pneumonia. This video is part of an NCLEX review series over respiratory disorders, so be sure to check out the other videos in this series. This video will be part one of pneumonia. In part two, I'm going to be covering the nursing interventions and the medications, specifically antibiotics, used in treating pneumonia. And I'm going to give you a clever mnemonic on how to remember that. In this video, I'm going to be hitting on the pathophysiology of pneumonia, the definition, the risk factors, how it's diagnosed, and the signs and symptoms. So as always, over here on the side and in the description below, you can access the quiz and the notes. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about the definition of pneumonia. What is it? In a nutshell, it is a lower respiratory tract infection that causes inflammation of the alveoli sacs. And remember, the alveoli sacs are responsible for gas exchange. And here on your diagram, the purple areas that look like little grape sacs is where the gas exchange occurs. And what they do is they inflate and deflate and they transport through a capillary wall carbon dioxide out so you can um, exhale it because this is a waste product of metabolism. And then it's gonna take that fresh oxygen that you just inhaled and um, have that transported through the body and the heart will help play a role in that as well. Now the key players in pneumonia. One key player are germs. This has attacked the system, which is called caused inflammation of that sac. And this germ can be a bacteria, a virus, or a fungi or a fungus. Um, very rare, but it can happen with a fungus. Also, the big thing that plays a part in pneumonia is your lung parachinum, which I like to call the trio for gas exchange. Is your alveoli, your alveolar ducts, and your bronchioles. Now let's talk about normal gas exchange and what's happening and then compare it to whenever someone has pneumonia and what's going on with them. Okay, normal gas exchange occurs whenever you take in oxygen up through your upper respiratory system, through the nose, down through those sinuses, down through the larynx, then it's gonna hit the lower respiratory system, which will include your trachea. Then the trachea will branch off at the carina into your right bronchus and your left bronchus, so your primary bronchi. Then it enters into the lungs of the hilum, which also your pulmonary artery and your pulmonary vein from the heart enter in at the hilum as well into the lungs because the heart, again, plays a big role in gas exchange. And then it breaks off into your secondary bronchi, your tertiary bronchi, to the bronchioles, to the alveolar ducts, and then, then into these alveolar sacs. Now, the alveolar sacs, here's one blown up so you can see it looks like normally, has capillaries setting on it from your pulmonary arteries and your pulmonary veins. And remember, the pulmonary artery from the heart takes unoxygenated blood to the lungs to become oxygenated. And then the pulmonary vein takes that oxygenated blood back to the heart. It's gonna go through the aorta and be pumped through the system so you can get some oxygen to your body. So that's what's happening constantly. These sacs are inflating and deflating. Carbon dioxide is leaving these sacs. You're gonna exhale that out. Car oxygen is coming into the sac, being trans um, transported onto red blood cells and carried throughout the system. So let's look at this up close. So here's an alveoli. And here you have a capillary running. This capillary is coming from the heart, so it's pulmonary artery. And it's unoxygenated, that's why they're blue. And these cells are exhausted and tired, so they're getting rid of that waste buildup of carbon dioxide and putting that into this alveoli so you can get rid of that through exhaling. And then, also at the same time, oxygen that you just freshly inhaled is going through this capillary wall and attaching, on, attaching to these exhausted red blood cells. And they're revived and ready to go back through the system. So they turn red and then they go to the heart through the pulmonary vein and do their job. Now, with pneumonia, what's going on here? Okay, well, what's happened? Normally, your respiratory system can normally fight off these germs that you're coming into contact every day on a daily basis through, you know, filtering out through your nose. But certain conditions can increase um, your ability of developing pneumonia and decrease your ability of your body's ability to um, fight off these germs. So what happens, say you get a bacteria, your body can't fight it off. 
what happens is that this alveoli sac starts to attack the alveoli sac and it gets inflamed. And when it gets inflamed, what happens is that things start to pull in there. So it starts to become full of fluid. This one's nice and um, spread out. It opens and closes. This one has become bogged down with fluid. Then your body has sensed that there's inflammation going on, so it sends its army of white blood cells to come and fight that infection that's there. So it starts to fill with red, white blood cells, and then you have your red blood cells that are normally there already getting stuck there, and they start forming along with that bacteria. So that's just way too much for the alveoli sac to inflate, to inflate and deflate. So what happens is that you don't have um, the ability of those cells to rid itself of carbon dioxide. So you're gonna have the buildup of carbon dioxide. Then you can't get that fresh oxygen to the system. So guess what? You're gonna have hypoxemia, low oxygen in the blood because that oxygen can't get to, through that capillary wall to be transported. So you're going to get conditions called respiratory acidosis, which we'll go over a little bit more here in a second, but I wanted to cover that with you so you can see that. Now, there's certain things that will increase a patient's um, chances of developing pneumonia. So let's look at those risk factors. Okay, a prior infection, such as influenza or a cold, a lot of times patients will get that and they will develop pneumonia because there's they've got this infection that's decreased their ability to filter out these germs and bacteria so they develop this along with whatever they have else going on. Also, if they have a weak immune system. Infants and elderly are definitely at risk for developing pneumonia. Um, HIV or if they're taking medications um, that are autoimmune to suppress the immune system, they're at risk for developing this because their body's not working like it should because it's suppressed. Another thing is if they're immobile, they're in bed, they've had a stroke that has um, made them where they're not allowed, to, where they can't move, or they've had some type of change in neuro status like uh, dementia, and these patients are really a lot at risk for aspiration where um, they may aspirate their stomach contents or food they eat into the lungs, which increases pneumonia. Or they have a lung problem, underlying issue like COP or pneumonia. As a nurse taking care of patients, I've had a lot of patients come in with pneumonia, especially during the winter time, fall time, and they have COPD and they got pneumonia. Or they are post-op from surgery. A lot of times, we talked about this in the incentives parameter NCLEX review video, we want to teach our patients before surgery how to use that incentives parameter after surgery because these patients usually are in pain, especially if they've had abdominal surgery or chest surgery, they don't wanna cough, deep breathe, take deep breaths, so they're at risk for developing this. Plus their system has just went through a major surgery and has stressed out their body, so their immune system isn't working as strong as it should. Now let's talk about respiratory acidosis. I talked a little bit about this at the beginning, now let's look at it a little bit more in depth, specifically those ABG values. Now if you're not familiar with respiratory acidosis, I have a whole NCLEX lecture on that. A card should be popping up so you can access that, it comes with a quiz and everything, so you can watch that and familiarize yourself with this condition. But what's happening in pneumonia, as we learn, those sacs are not being able to inflate and deflate, so the alveoli aren't being able, because they're so inflamed, they're so congested, they're not allowing those cells to release the carbon dioxide into the um, respiratory system so you can exhale it. So what's gonna happen is that your body is going to be keeping carbon dioxide, and we don't like that because it's a waste product and we want rid of it. In turn, the fresh oxygen that we just have taken in through inhalation isn't gonna get through that capillary wall to go to the heart so it can be transported through the system. So you're gonna have low oxygen in the blood, and the patient's gonna be experiencing hypoxemia. So you're Arterial blood gases, your ABGs, are going to reflect this. So we're gonna have high carbon dioxide and low oxygen in the blood. So typical ABGs are PO, PO2 is going to probably be about less than 90 millimeters of mercury. 
our blood pH because carbon dioxide, when we keep too much of that, it's a waste, it's an acid, and our blood is gonna become acidic. So our blood pH is going to drop. It's gonna run less than 7.35. And our PCO2, which is our carbon dioxide measurement, is going to be high because we are retaining carbon dioxide, so greater than 45. Now, your um, body tries to balance itself out. So the lungs and the kidneys and these acid, acid base imbalance try to help each other out. So what will happen, because you also look at your bicarb, and to compensate the kidneys, will try to keep or conserve the HCO3, which is your bicarb, to increase that blood's pH because it's so low right now, it's acidic, and a normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So you may see a bicarb if it's trying to help compensate um, be greater than 26. Now let's look at the causes. We talked about how bacteria can cause it, viruses and fungi. So let's talk a little bit more about those and then we'll talk about the types of pneumonia. Okay, so bacteria. Most pneumonia infections are bacteria. It's the most common, especially in your community acquired types of pneumonia. Um, Streptococcus pneumoniae is the most common type of bacteria that infects a person to cause them to have bacterial pneumonia. Another type of pneumonia is caused by an atypical bacterium and it causes what's called as walking pneumonia. We've all heard it. And it's caused by that type of bacteria, myco, mycoplasma pneumoniae. And um, walking pneumonia, how it's different, the symptoms tend to be a little bit more milder than um, straight up pneumonia. And uh, hence why they call it walking because it doesn't seem to be as severe to confound them to bed, require hospitalization. And that is what that, the ba that bacteria is what causes that. Then you have the viruses, some viruses that can cause pneumonia like influenza or RSV, which is a lot in your pediatric patients. And then fungi. Like I said, this is the least common. It tends to affect people who have weakened immune system. And they get it from just normal outside, like plants or animals, that healthy people who have strong immune systems can fight off normally, but because they're a weak immune system, normally something that a person wouldn't get, they just get it. Okay, now let's talk about the types. Okay, there's two types that I would be familiar with with their definition. Okay. You have community acquired, and this is the most occurring, and this is where the person has got that germ, bacteria, whatever they've got, outside of the healthcare set setting, hence why they call it community. They, they were acquired it somewhere in the community. Another type is hospital acquired. Um, a lot of patients who are on mechanical ventilation are at risk for this. The person has contracted this pneumonia germ somewhere within the hospital setting. Now this tends to be your worst type of pneumonia because the bacteria tends to be really strong and tends to be resistant to antibiotics. And the criteria for putting this as hospital acquired, I would remember this, is if the patient has developed it 48 hours to 72 hours after admission, it would be classified as hospital acquired pneumonia. So how is pneumonia diagnosed? A lot of times it will be picked up whenever you're auscultating with the stethoscope. The doctor may be listening and um, they may hear coarse crackles, ronchi, which is a type of wheezing, or bronchial breath sounds, which are normal breath sounds if heard in the tracheal area, but they're not normal if you hear them over the peripheral lung fields because it can represent lung consolidation. And I have a whole video series on um, with audio clips where you can listen to normal breath sounds and abnormal breath sounds. And a card should be popping up so you can access that. And the patient, along with these sounds, may have these other signs and symptoms. But this will usually lead to the doctor ordering a chest x-ray, which is a great way to diagnose pneumonia because they will be able to look at the lung field, see where it's at, and show infiltrates if they have any. And a sputum culture. A lot of times these patients have very productive coughs or coughing up all different color type stuff and you can send that sputum off and they can culture it to identify the type of bacteria or fungus that um, is causing the problem and which is great because whenever they pick medication therapy if it's a bacteria uh, they can pick 
if it's a gram positive or gram negative, what type of antibiotic they should use, which we'll be covering in part two. Okay, so what are the signs and symptoms of pneumonia? To help you remember this, remember the mnemonic pneumonia. We're talking about pneumonia, so just remember each letter and each letter will correspond with the sign and symptoms. So here are the typical signs and symptoms of pneumonia. P, productive cough or pleuritic pain. This type of pain is chest pain that the patient experiences whenever they're coughing or breathing. It feels like chest pain. N, for neuro changes, this is especially common in elderly patients. They probably won't even have a fever, but you'll notice that they're all of a sudden confused, they have an increased respiratory rate, and they're just really tired. So that's how they can present with that. E, for elevated labs, such as, as you've seen with the carbon dioxide, the PCO2, and increased white blood cells because your body is trying to fight infections, so those will be increased. U for unusual breath sounds. Again, you may hear these uh, coarse crackles, bronchi, or uh, those bronchial breath sounds within the peripheral lung fields. M for mild to high fever. Uh, the bacteria, if this is a bacterial cause of pneumonia, these patients can run really high temperatures, sometimes greater than 104 degrees Fahrenheit. O for oxygen saturation will be de decreased. A lot of times it'll be less than 90% and they will need supplementary oxygen. N for nausea and vomiting. These people absolutely just feel horrible. They don't feel like eating. They feel sick to their stomach. I for increased heart rate and respiratory rate. They'll be tachypenic and tachycardic because of the infection going on in the body and the hypoxemia because the heart, the lungs is trying to increase that respiratory rate to blow off that carbon dioxide they have and get some more oxygen in, but it's not working because it's all inflamed, those alveoli sacs. And then A, the last part of it, they'll be aching all over, they'll feel horrible, and they'll have activity intolerance with shortness of breath. Just simply moving from the bed to the chair will make them very winded. Okay, so that is part one of pneumonia. Be sure to check out part two, and don't forget to take that quiz, NCLEX review quiz on pneumonia. And thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.